Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are on the fifth year of GST. So it is customary for Tax India Online and uh, very much uh, expected by the tax paying public at large, the trade and industry, that a forum like uh, Tax India Online you know, takes to the viewers the overall impression or the overall expectations, the do's and don'ts, the success, the pitfalls, what is yet to be done after such perhaps a half a decade of GST. So in line with this thought, uh, Tax India Online has invited an esteemed panel for this evening to discuss GST way forward on the fifth year. And what are the expectations for the future? We have a star-studded panel. The panel consists of Mr. M.S. Mani. He needs no introduction. You see him more on all the channels of the televisions across India. Mr. Mani is from Deloitte. We have Mr. Bipin. And Mr. Bipin is from one of the leading life insurance firms on the tax side. We have Madam Rashmi Jain. She is also from the tax side. And uh, we also have with us our uh, veteran, Mr. Shivdas, Senior Advocate, Karnataka High Court, who will help us to understand many legal tangles that have come about after five years. And what are, what are, the, what are the thoughts, considering that the courts are the ultimate way forward? Now, before we go to the specific questions which we have here marked for the participants and we are trying to circulate through the panel. I just thought we will take a quick three to four minutes. Each panelist's overall impression at the end of four years, 12 months or five years, and what are in their opinion, the hits, the misses, and what do they expect at least in the next two years to make it more robust than what it is today. So we will first start with Mr. Mani, and then we will go to Mr. Shivdas, Mr. Bipin, and Rashmi for these views. Over to Mr. Mani. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Sridhar. So I think I would just like to make a point by saying that when we say GST has completed five years, five years is really speaking a very, very small period of time in the life of a tax legislation. If we look at the tax legislation that exists today, if we look at Income Tax Act, for instance, it's Income Tax Act 1961. If we look at the erstwhile legislation that we had prior to GST, we had Central Excise Act, which was 1944, which was a pre-independence legislation. We then had Central Sales Tax Act, which was a 1956 Act, if I recollect, you know, right. So when we talk of five years for a legislation, it's a very, very small period of time in the life of that particular legislation, both the act and the rules. Possibly, once we understand the fact that five years is in fact a small period of time in the life of any legislation, more so a tax legislation, we will be able to easily deal and grapple with some of the challenges that we are dealing with GST. To my mind, some of the challenges and some of the expectations are coming because uh, we expect that there will be a baby born and the baby will be born as an adult with all training, you know, with uh, perfect manners, perfect training, perfect language skills, perfect communication skills. But eventually, when a baby is born, it has to be taught. It learns from its peers. Some things it picks up on its own, something it has got to be taught. And then there is a process of evolution. Similarly, in case of GST, there have to be precedents, there have to be tribunals. We can't continue only with the authority of advance rulings. We can't continue only referring to high courts. Now, the legislation again that we have in GST is a fairly complex piece of legislation. Now, is the complexity because the lawmakers wanted to make it complex? Possibly no. It is complex because the fact that we are a very diverse country with a federal structure, which 30 states, which continue to want to have taxing power and some say in the overall scheme of you know things, a basket of goods and services. We used to say we are predominantly a services economy. The export data for the last one year post Delta wave 
clearly indicates that the merchandise exports are very, very critical for us together with the service exports. So when we are a complex country of 1.3 billion, 1.4 billion people, 30 states, each state has a different language, different food habits, people look different, worship different gods also. We are actually looking at a situation where the tax legislation has to reflect the people living in that country and their aspirations, their requirements, the supply chains, the logistics that it needs. Consequently, what we have as CGST, IGST and SGST truly reflects the diversity of the country. Since we are again formed on democratic principles, it is open to people who know the subject. Uh, it is also open to a lot of people who are not very familiar with tax subjects to come and say that, look, anything, you know, goes wrong in the supply chain, anywhere the wheels of, you know, something stops. GST ke wajah se hua hai. GST ke pehle to achcha tha. GST mein ye ho gaya. Now, I respect the views of everyone. But at the same time, we have to understand that five years is too short a period for any legislation to achieve any degree of maturity. And possibly over the next five years, we are aspiring to get into that degree of maturity where policies and processes will be a little more certain. Rate changes will be very infrequent. The returns will get established. The portal will work very, very smoothly in a completely glitch-free manner. Refunds will get processed without a manual intervention. If all of those happen in the next five years, and if the GST from being a, a toddler uh, becomes an adolescent, I think that is terrific. But even over the next five years, we should not expect the toddler to jump into becoming a teenager. In a very different context, we have seen what happens when a toddler becomes a teenager. A toddler gets into all bad habits early on in life. So there is a period when the toddler has to become an adolescent, the adolescent becomes a teenager and then becomes an adult. That is a natural process. So while normally we say that and that you achieve adulthood at the age of 18 or 21 or whatever, in this case, we might possibly achieve adulthood when we are 10 or 12 years old. But that amount of time we have to give to the legislation, we have to give to GSTN, we have to give to all the authorities who are administering it so that we are able to reap the true benefits of GST. That is Thank the you. way I would summarize the way GST is today. Thank Over you, to you, Mr. Sridhar. Thank you. Shiv, I think uh, Mani has outlined his uh, expectations from the consulting side very well. So, what is it if a legal luminary like you looks at it from the specs of the serving High Courts of India and the Supreme? How would you look at the five years of GST, its expectations for the next five years, whether five years is too little a period to judge it, etc. Over to you, Shiv, please. A very good evening to all of you. Now, GST, as we uh, envisaged in 2017, is not, in my view, a, a new act that tries to tax new activities. Essentially, when we talked about GST, it was an amalgamation of all the existing indirect taxes. So you talked about an excise, you talked about a VAT, you talked about a service tax. So it was a combination of all these acts, you are making it into a GST act. Now that's how, if you have seen the model law that came in August 2016, if I am not mistaken, and the second model law that came in 2000, November 2016, all these model laws essentially were a, a verbatim reproduction of some of these acts borrowing, uh, accepting, making some small changes in terms of the taxable events from a manufacturer, from a sale, from a providing of service, it went to a supply, then goods and services definition, goods were taken from the existing definition of sales tax, services were taken from the finance act. So it was essentially an, an amalgamation of all these acts. The reason why I'm pointing out is, the expectation from this amalgamated act was that the learnings from the existing laws would be used when you are implementing this amalgamated act. 
that was the fundamental premise based on which gst got implemented that's how the the departments implementing it were more or less the same you never had you don't have a, a new department that implements gst they come with their experience of handling an excise or a sales tax or a vat who will handle this gst therefore the my expectation at least from the gst law as it came in 2017 was that yes we will use our knowledge uh, the industry will use its familiarity with the existing laws to adapt to the new gst law that was how the expectations start now from an uh, act perspective i am not getting into the uh, how the act could have been uh, interpreted better etc but let's assume let's take the act as it stands from an act perspective the intentions were clear the objectives were quite broad out the flip side of it according to me came from an adopting an electronic system to be the only basis for all your remedies that is where the whole thing started now the the assessors were definitely wanting to adopt to the system as early as possible no big industry today wants to go away from the from complying with the laws that's the fundamental thing today what used to happen at least i have been in practice for the past 25 30 years what used to be the attitude of the industry maybe about 15 years before is not the attitude of the industry is today nobody wants to go away from complying with the laws but if you are trying to match and compliance with a rigid system which the government is not able to uh, i would say adapt to the requirements of the systems of industries there is a disconnect now in my view the while the uh, the the good advantages of the gst in terms of increasing the number of uh, the gst active registrations i am told i was reading about 1.3 like 1.36 crores of registrants are there today in gst and your income is about 1.5 crores 1.5 lakh crores as of the per jew and then you are looking at uh, the the advantages of bringing in more or more of informal economy into the formal economy all discussions taking place with all the chief minister the finance ministers coming together all discussions taking place decisions being taken on a consensual basis about 46 meetings also have been held in these five years all these are all good good issues regarding the consequence of gst but the flip side is where you try to judge a necessity by the way he is able to adapt to a gst and system that is where i think the flip side is today so the five years which mr mani was talking about that is too short a period i completely agree but you are not talking about too short a period for a new law you are talking about a, a, a law that is borrowing all its concepts from the existing laws therefore the administrators should be better equipped to administer it and be the the place where they are able to guide the ssc to adapt to the system faster now the disconnect has happened there now the dissatisfaction of the ssc is not with the law by itself it is with the manner in which it is getting implemented the manner in which the system has reverted back to them that is where i think the flip side is however nobody today um, disagrees with the intention of gst one tax less of cascading effect less less rates of taxes maybe the the rates compared to other countries could be more but we still have only six or seven rates less of cascading effect then more um, uh, formal economy people getting connected through the systems all that is absolutely laudable but the miss according to me is only in trying to hold on to the system and say either you go through the system or you don't get any relief that is where i think assessees would feel bad now as a when we go into it we will explain get into the details thank you so much shiv um, uh, i would now request bipin because a consultant and a lawyer is different from a person from the trade and industry per se so trade and industry has got its own views because it is the it is the institution that ultimately bears the baggage and handles the baggage also of gst so over to mr bipin 
on the beginning of the fifth year what are your views good afternoon everyone thanks for giving me an opportunity to express my views in this esteemed forum uh, so as our esteemed speakers have highlighted obviously from the consultants and lawyers point of view but i think their points of view are indeed valid their uh, comments on the gst evolution till date of 5 years from 2017 are indeed a very pointing you know uh, uh, are very valid in the in terms of how the gst has evolved and the expectations also have been expressed very clearly by both of them uh, now speaking purely from industry perspective we are i, I am from the service industry so i would put the expectation in a very simplistic manner though at a cost of uh, excuse me mr money at the cost and mr shivdas at the cost of the consulting practice i would like this legislation to move in such a direction that there would be no need for any tribunal or high court it may be a wish list it may be a it may be a i mean an impossible thing but as we await clarity by way of tribunal or high court or supreme court i think that will cross generations so can we move the legislation in a current from its current form to a very simplistic form where there is no need for precedents so that is the first expectation from the government which i i feel we should be able to achieve if we have progressive minded you know uh, drafting up legislation and uh, as rightly pointed out by mr shivdas it's a procedural uh, compliances uh, is the way the department is as of now trying to judge uh, the sec this is also a valid point Uh, it should not be the sole judge, judgment criteria for uh, evaluating an SSC's, uh, uh, you know, intention of complying with the law or otherwise. Uh, the next is uh, I was just uh, within many forums. I have in the Life Insurance Council also we have debated that whether there could be a possibility. I, Mr. Mani, I may correct me if I am wrong. Internationally, uh, there have been GST laws which uh, have industry-specific chapters. If I am not wrong. so as i am coming from the life insurance industry uh, it's a very uh, very specific and very specialized uh, valuation rules etc and can we have uh, aviation will have something different i mean banking will have something different manufacturing sectors will have some different and uh, in telecom will have some other compulsions so can we look i mean we should have looked at ideally uh, sector wise bible of gst but i think that is a too far fetch but that also can be evolved going forward because a general law of course drafters cannot draft a law uh, for all the sectors separately but there is some sector wise you know income tax we have some sector wise sections provisions specific to some sections so if any specific dispensation some sector wants i think it could be considered as an expectation going forward otherwise as already mentioned by our esteemed speaker this has been a, a much wanted uh, legislation to avoid the cascading effect transparency and you know uh, bring the transparency into the tax system and overall ecosystem of the economy uh, and also it is a very positive step taken from 2017 and i guess uh, with or without tribunal precedents it will indeed uh, achieve some certainty in the next 5 to 10 years over to you mr shridhar thank you so much bipin uh, definitely i mean to one or two of your points may look very very utopian i must not say utopian because i am also on the reporting side but to say uh, a life sans people like mr mani and shivdas will not look as interesting as it is today so that's uh, that's very very i mean i must say on the to be at least to put things on the lighter side i can react like this so that uh, you know to expect a life without the tribunal and the courts uh, madam rashmi jain thank you so much uh, for uh, coming on board uh, what are your views uh, from the from from a from the trade and industry perspective in terms of overall experience of five years i mean there is you know each one looks at it differently but there is something called the basic experience of five years what thank is you. your overall experience of this five years firstly good evening everyone and thank you for having me here uh, so i think uh, most of the points have already been covered but if i talk from the service industry uh, prior to gst we had the service tax right so we were used to a centralized registration two returns in a year which suddenly multiplied to independent registration for each state and multiple compliances right so if if i do the maths it was like two returns versus a say 120 returns in a year 
So over the period, uh, the compliances have increased. The cost of compliance has increased. Uh, there have been pluses. There have been automations, um, you know, clarifications coming in, uh, uh, doubts being cleared. But if you see the complexity, that has just been increasing. And over the years, it's it's been a learning experience, right? Uh, like even Mr. Shivda said, every year we have something new coming in. We adjust it to this GST uh, law and set up our ERP systems to match it. And then in 2018, we had the e-way bills. Then came the 2A, 3B reconciliations, and then the e-invoicing, the dynamic QR code. So if you see overall, the, the industry has just been struggling to meet up with the expectations uh, in this small period of five years, right? So ERP can't be automated and updated that quickly. So that's that's something uh, which we are on our toes, let me put it that way. We are on our toes to just match up with all these changes. On the plus side, as I said, you know, uh, the clarifications and all are welcome. Uh, for the service industry, uh, the biggest plus was getting credits for the goods which is not available under the um, erstwhile regime. So uh, at least that that is available now. So overall, that way it's, it's got its own plus and minuses. Go forward, I would go with, with Mr. Bipin, you know, if we could do away with the litigations and stuff. But that said, uh, which is which is I don't think possible, but at least, you know, some simplicity in compliances. And uh, again, going back to the centralized registration if possible, right? Uh, the whole thing about ease of doing business. Thank you so much, Rashmi ji. Yeah. Uh, so now let's get into some, uh, some, some other questions beyond the overall experience and the expectations. Let's get to a few, uh, you know, focused issues. Sir. See, one focused issue, which I thought I'll go around the table would be that, uh, See, when we started, we started with the larger principle. When you see the movement of integration of costs into the ultimate product or the service, we started with pseudo integration in service tax. We moved to a complete integration later on, which was also not complete. Now, come GST, they said, yeah, it's complete integration. Now, if from a standing practice perspective, can we very safely say that? Today, integration is absolute, point number one. Or is still the national makeup, which primarily consists of the revenue from both the states and the GOI, is still caught because they want to get into the complete integration as far as ITC is concerned. But we are always caught in a bind. Every time we come up for clarifications, whether this can be allowed, this can be be allowed uh, or overall can we reduce the number of disputes because 50 to 60 percent of the reported disputes if you were to ask if i were to time it up from ti oils reported decisions is around involving around ITC. so from that perspective mr money let's start with mr money and then i'll go to mr shiv for his perspective from the courts what are your views at this stage do you think that we are Totally being unfair, no integration is absolute. We still have some graining issues which we need to iron out. Mr. Mani. Okay. Look, for I don't think we will ever have a situation where the integration is absolute. And the reason why that can't happen is that trade, business, processes, e-commerce, everything is evolving very, very fast. So whatever rules are made, Business progresses faster than the rulemaking speed. And this is not true of India alone. It is true of the entire world. So at any point of time, we will have some issues to do with lack of integration, lack of fungibility, a dispute involving a taxpayer and the taxman. That is bound to happen. In some ways, I would say that's also a very healthy sign because it indicates that we have a right to disagree with the tax authorities, which is a fundamental right all over. And at some point of time, if we take away that right, if either the taxpayer says the views of the taxman are final, or the taxman is told that if certain categories of taxpayers, so, you know, let's say insurance companies, whatever insurance companies do is full and final. You can't raise a dispute even if you want to. That to me is imperfect. Now, the key to my mind over here, when we are talking of input tax credit, is to keep the differences of views to the minimum. Will it get eliminated? It will never ever get eliminated. 
and some of us have dealt with senvat prior to gst some of some old people like me have dealt with modvat before senvat also and one of the things that is very fundamental is the kind of disputes that we used to have in modvat and senvat never ever ended so so on and on an anecdotal basis uh in terms of the senvat credit that was allowed most of us are familiar with senvat there was this company which had a township in india where they house their factory and in that township they had a problem with stray dogs so they appointed an agency to catch all these dogs sterilize those dogs and put them in the forest now the company claimed input tax credit on the dog catching service and the company said that look if the dog bites my employee my employee won't report for work if my employee doesn't report for work i am not productive i can't i can't run my you know manufacturing and therefore the dog catching service has a nexus with my manufacturing facility they finally lost the case in tribunal that's another story but the point remains we have got people in india tax professionals finance professionals and others who are extremely creative by nature and by nature we all of us have this habit of saying the moment i see gst on an invoice mere ko kyun credit nahi milega is the first question the question is not am i entitled to the credit is this a part of my business am i using it for my business those questions follow later the first question is my chairman bought a car why can't i get input tax credit for my chairman's car the chairman is the chairman of the organization why can't i get input tax credit for the car so okay. on input tax credit the disputes will continue okay if those disputes are kept at some minimal level in that case i don't mind the disputes at all not because it gives work to people like me okay. but because of the fact that having some disputes with the tax authorities will make us a little different from many other countries i'm not naming any of them i mean most of you can make out you know the countries that i'm alluding to where they have a concept of what is known as a golden tax credit machine and in terms of the golden tax credit machine what happens is when you print an invoice on which somebody can take an input tax credit the printer as well as the software that runs that printer is supplied by the tax authority so if you need 40 printers to print invoices and five printers break down or one day the software does not work there is nothing you can do you cannot buy your own printers you cannot use your own software the software as well as the hardware for printing output invoices is provided by the tax authority equally when you receive an input tax credit invoice you have to scan the invoice and mail it to a particular mail id of the tax authority and the tax authority will pick invoices at random and get back to you by saying why did you take credit on this but you have to do that for every invoice okay. now so unless that we are in a situation where the law says please go ahead and take credit if you feel it relates to your business there is a small negative list of input tax credit there are certain things on which input tax credit is not permitted for the rest of it it is permitted but the challenge for the law makers the challenge for the tax administrators also is we have people who show extreme creativity in tax matters in india okay i understand i take i get your point shiv see i think you heard what the money was uh, views are now i am just adding one pinch to this whole whole theory now there are a few people who came uh, to tiol uh, and said that you raised this issue for us and they said that if you go by the rules of evidence you are supposed to preserve an invoice now after electronic invoicing where the limits are depleting every day we started with 100 crores where is 100 crores e invoicing anymore it's fallen so short down in terms of number of crores they are saying the evidence is available in the backyard but 16 remains unamended now i am trying to quote this only as an example to the question that i have raised with mr money so your 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 experience in this last 6 years you must have under, attended so many red courts in the country your firm must have represented so many industries are we still caught between the bind in your opinion as a lawyer or 
No, as Mr. Mani says, we are extremely creative in asking for in input tax credits. So there should be an ultimate balance. Uh, a couple of things. One is the when you are talking about uh, integration of an SSE's documents, right from the stage uh, the supplier's documents comes to him, and then gets integrated into his uh, into his one, and then it becomes a part of his two A, and then it's part of part of his three. That there is a complete integration that seems to be happening in the system, right? Now, while the uh, section will say that you should be in possession of an invoice for you to take the credit. What it would mean is that you should have a document relating to that particular uh, consign. That is what it means. Now, in the context of the electronic system, whether you should rely on the e-invoicing that is embedded as part of the system or whether you should have it in hand for the purpose of taking credit is a matter of, uh, uh, I, I would not even say it's a matter of dispute. The, the authorities may not get into it saying that I have a, I have in, in my in my system I have the document therefore you produce it to me again I don't think they would get into that so therefore there it is possible that they will they can always rely on the documents available in the system to say that I will look at your entire documentation and therefore the credit should be available to you so I don't see a problem there now the the problem comes where you see we should understand when most of us claim input tax credit, I mean, I we should not judge the majority of the SSEs with reference to few few creative input tax credit takers. I mean, I am not of that uh, view at all. You can't judge 99 people based on what one person does. Now we have evolved on this input tax scheme right from 1986. How in 86 it was restricted? Over a period of time, how it became more wider, maybe in uh, 94, then in 2004, and now in 2017. So we are essentially looking at a credit being available to an SSE if it relates to his business. And nobody today will expend an amount if it doesn't relate to his business. I'm talking about 99%, I'm not talking about the 1%. So if, if you want to restrict credit, Restrict credit in terms of what you relate to a personal consumption, but give credit in respect of his business. That is how the theory of input tax credit could normally operate. And that's how your entire section 16 or 17 or red with 17 file is worded. Now the, the problem comes when you expand the scope of 17 file through your own interpretations to say, I will look at when is your personal consumption stops or when is your business stops and when does your personal consumption start now there if you get into an interpretation the scope of 17 5 gets completely expanded by means of interpretation not by the manner in which it is worded in the law so that is where i think most of the disputes are being raised today even in the gst you see across the, the span of advanced rulings that are getting passed now i am not on what, what is the nature of these advanced rulings and uh, what is the, uh, the sanctity we are, we are able to attribute to it? That's a different point. There are any number of advanced rulings that are seeking to rely on 17.5 and deny input tax credit on uh, so many expenses which relate to the business. Therefore, where are we for, where are we progressing in terms of giving a much more wider approach to the industry in terms of saying that we will follow what we have given to you in the past you continue to take it later today also in the GST. The problem comes there. I think my disconnect with the, the theory today being adopted in the field is only there. Please stick to the law. The law is as clear worded neatly. No issues on that. Stick to what is required to be excluded. Stick to that. Don't try to judge the inclusion by the exclusion. That's what my... Uh, yeah. Thank you, Shiv. Only one thing, Shiv, before uh, I admit the purpose is not to make this meeting into a meeting considering GST Council's decisions. But in the press note, they have, they have also put in one of the sections that there will be issuing a circular on 17.5. So to answer your, I mean, I don't know whether the cat is out of the bag or it is still in the bag or where the cat is because Mr. Money will definitely be very, 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 very different maybe after he reads the circular also. How things are going to go beyond, uh, beyond the scope of law.
But for a moment, let's come back to the industry. I mean, I would like to ask Bipin, more from a process control perspective and a process-based perspective, with regard to the GST schemes, I mean, scheme as a whole, have you introduced more process-based control? So therefore, you have spent a lot in terms of manners. Forget the cost. The cost for the insurance industry, definitely if there is some other law, you will be definitely spending that much. But have you increased the number of controls only because of this law? Is that a situation uh, there with you, uh, I mean, at the industry at large, Bipin, or no? Uh, the answer for a start is, of course, yes. There is There has indeed been a lot of onus, a lot of onus on systems, controls, processes. See, as a service industry, uh, it was difficult for us to move from a self-assessment mechanism, like service tax, where credit was not generally questioned, to a, to a scenario where it was a full system-based assessment, allowability of credit. Sorry, so, Pippin, can you please... Suggest? Hello, am I audible? Your, adjust your volume, huh. because uh, your volume yeah, yeah. seems to have fallen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, please increase your volume. Yeah. Maybe the listeners may not be... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it yeah, okay now? Yeah, it's clear. Please go ahead. Sorry okay. to disturb. Yeah. No problem. So, uh, as I was telling for the service industry as a whole, uh, any, any service industry, it was difficult for us to migrate. The, the roadmap for five years was from a self-assessment based assessment of service tax. We have moved to a totally compliance uh, system driven uh, allowability of ITC. And maximum in this journey, we have faced many roadblocks. The major roadblock speed breakers, you may say, is of course input credit. Because at every stage, this has been questioned for the past few years. Of course, we are not yet uh, crossed the line of uh, litigation beyond a certain level. But yes, though on paper integration has done, it's perfect. And we are mostly getting all the credit as of now. But my only worry in this is that, as Mr. Sridhar and Mr. Mani have pointed out, the, the dispute should be purely based on legal interpretation rather than procedural, uh, uh, la not lapses, I would say, procedural disconnects, like something is not visible, something is not... Uh, so that, of course, that has to be viewed with great uh, uh, care that whether the non-compliant uh, non parties are indeed uploading the invoices. But my only opinion going forward, the ITC challenge from the department perspective should be more on a technical and... Uh, legal basis rather than a procedural basis. So uh, while the integration has been final, I have no complaints on that. We have, uh, as Rashmi pointed out, we are getting the credit for the input credit of goods also. That is a very plus point for the service industry. But since we have moved, and and, and some of our uh, colleagues in the manufacturing industry have had the experience uh, of VAT before. So they are actually well uh, uh, adapted to the system from a number of years back, you know, they're uh, cross-checking, especially Maharashtra introduced in 2005, it introduced a self-checking yeah. mechanism. So uh, we are yet, you know, to reach that level. So till that time, uh, just a support will be helpful that only on procedural issues don't deny the credit. If any blatant violation is noticed, of course, we are not be claiming the credit, but generally it should only be on a legal, legal interpretation basis, you can deny the credit. And uh, one more last point is that uh, across the uh, there is a concept of uh, a cross charge which we are uh, wanting to do the cross charge and that there will be huge leakage so whether that leakage can be addressed by you know uh, by some uh, some benevolent provisions in the law rashmi ji what is your view from a challenge perspective in the last 5 years is it only um, been ITC or has it been something beyond ITC? What is your view before we go to the next topic so that quickly we can go to the next round? Sure. So ITC is definitely top of the chart. Um, and just to add to what Mani said, you know, just recently uh, we had one of our uh, GST refunds being audited. And trust me, they disallowed us credit even on consulting fees. Right. So we had invoices coming from consultants and they said this does not belong to your this does not uh, relate to your business. And hence it's, it's disallowed. So ITC is the major challenge there. Uh, firstly, the onus on the service recipient uh, uh, to ensure that the vendors are compliant. Right. So the recipient is uh, being penalized for the wrongdoing of the vendors. Right. So that's that's blocking the working capital as well. The other thing would be uh, we have registrations in multiple states. Each state has its own requirement for documentation. We have we file GST refunds in multiple states. 
each states come back comes back with you know uh, their own uh, documents that they need so there needs to be a standardization across states because uh, it's it's there in law you can't go beyond that and uh, we've seen we've uh, faced ex, you know in some of our states so motor blocking of credits now that's a big challenge uh, in our industry where you end up paying cash for uh, uh, you know output liability because your credits have been blocked right so uh, all of this majorly to do with itc credits the one thing is that uh, considering that we have had uh, we have had our fair share of disputes in the first 5 years and considering that uh, the high courts are attending to many of these because we don't have a formal tribunal in place and also taking one clue from the last council meeting that one more interministerial committee is there to get into the creation of the tribunals and you all of us know what's happening in the supreme court in the last two years with regard to tribunal appointments etc so many other cases are have a, have a evolving and a bearing on this uh, so now on this i think i'll start backwards from shiv and i go to money because she will be the most impacted then money then the industry so do you really feel the stress on the high courts is very very high or you think we still have time for creation of tribunals shiv uh, no i think 5 years is too long a period for the uh, tribunal not to be created there's no question of uh, saying that uh, we still have to decide on the the manner in which the tribunals have to be uh, composition has to be there etc i think they are definitely there by 5 years is too long period we should have had a tribunal maybe in about 2 or 3 years time and i i am not getting into the uh, the arguments for or against the government in terms of what sort of tribunal members have to be there that's a yeah, different I, point apart from the supreme court uh, uh, observations yeah maybe maybe what uh, i always keep saying this you see you have an existing sestat functioning you have the existing vat tribunals functioning you know some yeah. somebody came up with a very good idea that why not you have the existing vat tribunals with the central member being opted into it at the end of the day that's what uh, you are here looking at being functioning as a gst tribunal for a particular uh, a state and then a sestat having a state tribunal functioning as an maybe a, a national tribunal or an area tribunal etc so these are all things that could be done because 5 years is too long a period and the number of writ petitions that are getting filed in the high court is i think uh, phenomenal and looking at the workload of the high courts we should always be clear tax is never the priority in a high court we should be very clear on that because i mean there is nothing to say that they should not give preference to tax but then the number of subjects somebody deals with a tax judge deals with is phenomenal he starts from a company matter he starts with an arbitration then he gets into somebody gets into a family matter then a civil dispute so in all this very tax so therefore from a court's perspective tax is not all that important but from a company's perspective tax is the important for it therefore the the high courts are definitely loaded burdened there and every every uh, matter where a, the first appellate authority passes an order no company waits for the tribunal to be constituted make use of the notification to say from the date of the tribunal's constitution we get 3 months to file an appeal no company waits for it and most of the orders that are passed on rejection of refunds and obviously you can't wait in the rejection of a refund to wait for the tribunal to be constituted your future refund claims will go for a 6 and rejection of refund means automatic a liability on an output activity you will follow with a demand so all of them have to necessarily go to a high court and therefore the load of the high court is very high and any number of issues that are there in the high court the check post issue and e waiver issue it's it's phenomenal so my uh, take is that we have delayed in setting up the gst tribunal we should have done it long back we should not be delaying it further the way i, I thought when we saw the press release last time that there will be some uh, uh, solution to the the setting up of the tribunal but then today we are told that there will be a separate uh, group of ministers being set up to take the views of the state 
before the tribunal is constituted. So I think we will take about like six to eight months or one year for it to function. You are looking at the disputes for the next one year going back to the High Court. Uh, money, uh, considering that last point, I wouldn't like to go through the same question with you in a, diff uh, in a different way. I think it should be better that whether the existing SISTAT can take the load of, uh, SISTAT and the VAT tribunals can take the load of uh, the, uh, the GST work, which came from Mr. Shivdas's point. Was that another way of looking at it so that, you know, see, let's get started. There's no point in complaining about the existing law. We must try to get moving as quick as possible on our feet and try to work uh, from an overall perspective so that the trade and industry does not get affected. Is that a possible solution, uh, Mani? See, I think uh, no one will disagree what, with what Mr. Shivdas said on the delay in setting up tribunals. Yes, it should have been set up. You know, I mean, that obvious. Maybe I would in fact say that it should have been set up within a year of GST law being enacted. We should not have taken more than 12 months to, you know, set it up. The challenge that I face is I do not know the reasons which have prevented it from being set up till now. I am not privy to the reasons as to why the tribunals in GST have not yet been set up. But I'm sure there are many reasons which possibly somebody in the government will be, you know, aware of. To your question in terms of can the existing CSTAT take over the functions, I am not sure Mr. Shivdas would be the better person to answer on whether that is legally permissible. My sense is there would be a legal bar over there. And they assuming may not be we, permitted. Assuming, sorry to interrupt, uh, Shamani. Assuming we create the legal whatever is the impediment if they are able to put a patchwork on the concerned laws. So the existing, see, my point is you can't create uh, infrastructure members overnight, isn't it? It was going to take a lot of time. So if the ministerial group, I, the purpose is not to discuss the ministerial group meeting, but then they will take time. It has to come back to the council. The Supreme Court observations on three, four cases will also have to be taken into account. All this is once again looking at another one and a half years. So some kind of a solution because there's no point in just crying about the milk that is lost. Yeah, I really don't have a solution for this one because I think, you know, I mean, many legal minds like Mr. Shivdas would have applied themselves to what is the solution yeah. to this particular, you know, situation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have to bear in mind that the existing tribunal is also extremely hard pressed for time and the pendency in the existing tribunal is also very, very high. Okay. So it is not that in the existing tribunal, people file a case now and it gets heard in six months. There is a pendency <laughs> that they are dealing with. So do we want to increase that pendency by having the GST cases also? It's not something which, <clears throat> you know, I, like I said before, the reasons why the tribunal has been not been set up till now could have various reasons and various factors, which I am not privy to. Yes, yes Mr. Shivadas, please go ahead. No, the, see, the pendency in the uh, existing SESTAT is not because of the fact that uh, they have, uh, uh, say, too many matters to handle. It's because of the non-functioning of the tribunal itself. In most of the places, you don't have benches. So, and the, the, the time they sit is hardly maybe about 15 days in a month and then maybe once in two months. So, it's unfair that when you sit for 15 days, how many matters you can hear and you can dispose of. At the end of the day, the functioning of the SESTAT is something which is absolutely to be proud of. So, therefore, the, the, not, the burden is not because that the the SESTAT is not able to do it. It is because the members are not there in SESTAT. You know, benches are not functioning. Existing benches with the adequate members, full staff, what we used to have maybe in the, the late 90s, etc. If that is what is there, in my view, the existing uh, pendency can definitely come down. All we are talking about is a, a, an arrangement by which the SSEs can feel that even their GST matters are being heard. Today, that is where the uh, helplessness on the part of the SSEs. Uh, one, one more question from a trade and industry perspective, I must say so. This is They say, you know, the proof of the pudding is in the 18. So let's come to 17, 18 and 18, 19 Bipin, both for Bipin and Rashmi. Now, the exams are over. We only wait for answer marks, isn't it? So now, what are the answer marks of 17, 18, and 18, 19? I don't think Mani and Shivdas can answer this question. This is 
purely for the trade and industry. What are the answer marks of 17, 18 and 18, 19? Where do you stand, Bipin, in your N number of registrations? Where does Rashmi stand? What are your, what are your pain points? Is this, is this giving more number of legal issues than what you have anticipated so that you may have to go and keep knocking at the doors of Mr. Money for the next six to nine months continuously? Or, the, or you've got good marks in the answer sheets for 17, 18 and 18, 19? Uh, uh, you have, I hope I was hoping that you also mentioned 1920, 2020 in the question. Okay, and I, I, so, I am so, only looking at the first two years, assuming that you would have finished two years. If you are so ambitious to take the other years, I am willing to go on with that. I, I am more ambitious because I would like to give more marks to my company and the compliance from the compliance <laughs> side because 1920, 2021 is definitely uh, we have evolved much more. Uh, as rightly pointed out by you that 1718, uh, all of us were grappling in the dark. So uh, it was a very, very difficult year for us. And uh, the problem is it has compounded now because now the audits have started of the department. And uh, for all the current years, we are, I think, better prepared, better equipped system-wise, prepared-wise. But 1718, since the even the other SECs were not too much comfortable and too much you know, compliant at that time, not, not, not compliant, but systems were not in place. So 17, 18, 18, 19, I think we were uh, a bit of a, we're evolving, especially 17, 18. But uh, otherwise, subsequent years, we have, I think, settled down comfortably. We have going, we are, I mean, our going has been good for other years. But as far as the marks are concerned, uh, it is not worth the mention for 17, 18, 18, 19. It is, I could say, not a very high score from our side. Rashmi, to you, over to you. So, uh, uh, well, I, I could proudly say we were quite compliant. We were all set for GST um, and we so, were... Sorry, I sorry, mean, we've been... sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I, I may not be mistaken that we are not compliant. We are compliant, but we are not uh, up, up there. I mean, please, <laughs> please, please, please go ahead, Rashmi. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, I think we we managed quite well, uh, and as Bipin said, you know, uh, it, it's constantly evolving. So even our checks and balances are evolving. But if I talk about uh, from an audit perspective or uh, the experience that we've had uh, in filing GST refunds, for that matter, the experience has been different in different states, right? Some states have been pretty, uh, uh, you know, easy to manage, uh, not manage, but easy to. Uh, deal with and uh, you know with all the documentations in place there was no uh, major concerns created while other, Sorry, Ashley, other but i'm more focused on assessments so if you were to ask you the focused question of assessments the answer marks is for the assessments are your assessments completed and how are your answer marks no. looking no so there are no assessments completed <laughs> No, no scrutiny assessments no uh Shri, just to uh, in a lighter way i think they will know their marks somewhere in 2023 when they are three years or five years from the date of the annual return, we'll yeah, that has also yeah. got extended. Yeah. That, that is when they really know where their marks are. Sir, we were yeah. hoping, sir, we were hoping that the COVID uh, way will have some benefits for us by way of letting go a couple of years uh, from the assessment cycle, but I think that didn't work out. Okay. So well, they have got. We will not get into that. Those are all issues. <laughs> <laughs> One more, uh, coming back to the technical side, one more issue. See, is the word out on cross-charge versus ISD. Now, this is something that is really, once again, picked up a lot of tempo and heat after this Dindal case recently. And uh, more, more so, common services procured as a concept if it is mixed up with inter-officer services. So, is the word out? Definitely, we will ask Mr. Shivdas after you have answered this. But what's your view, Mani? Okay, so to my mind, fundamentally, cross-charge versus ISD is a precise illustration of what I was speaking earlier and alluding to tax creativity. We have far too many people who are creative in tax. Now, my take with many of them has been that, look, they would be better off in creative functions, become a painter, become a musician, become a movie producer, director, actor. Your creative skills can be put to use there. Tax is very straight and basic. It says you got to do this or it says you should not be doing this. So ISD and cross charge have been used over the last three, four years as if these are interchangeable actions and a taxpayer an option of doing A or B. Now that is not the way the law was framed. 
that is not the way the law was even during the service tax period because input service distributor existed even earlier there are certain situations where you have to take an isd registration it is not optional if you want to move that credit the law asks you to take an isd take an isd move the credit it is not open to a taxpayer to say look i won't i don't want to take isd because my compliance will increase and therefore i will cross charge so these are two specific pieces which are used in specific situations and i am very happy with the fact that the people whom we have been advising over the last 5 years we have been saying this despite the fact that there were many others who were saying that these are to be used interchangeably you can either do isd or you can do cross charge we had put our foot down even 4 years back much much before you know pandemic started by saying no isd is to be used in these situations your situation requires you to take an isd please do isd or in your situation you are not permitted to take an isd you can only do a cross charge so when we use the term isd and cross charge i am very happy that now we are starting to have some divisions which seem to be recognizing the fact that it is situation specific these are not interchangeable terms can i use this or can i use this uh shiv uh overall what do you feel shiv no i i After agree with money that uh, yes isd has to operate in certain situations and uh, cross charging has to operate in certain situations cross charging is for an activity you do for others and you pay your output liability your isd is essentially for the input services you receive and you want to distribute while uh, from a a plain reading of the provisions and implementation of it as it is is what can lead to this conclusion see at the end of the day i always see it like this the cross charging relates to an output liability of an assessee of a registrant unit the isd relates to a credit that is available to him which he can distribute to somebody else now if you you can correct yourself going for the future you can say that this is what i i should do and therefore correct yourself but for the past in case you have done it that you have taken a credit you stop using an isd you have cross charged it and then the other unit takes credit we always the courts always will see it from an i would say a global perspective an optical perspective that at the end of the day what has happened in this matter has the credit been taken utilized cross charged or has the credit been distributed that that is where it will look at so from an implementation perspective for the past i think slightly a different view can be taken for the future yes read it down literally to say for this i will do an isd for this i will do a cross charge okay. that is possible to take so now let's get back to see there are so many things that happened in 17 when they set up sector sectoral committees so people were expecting that there is a gst 2 and a gst 3 in certain terms of evolvements of many amendments which many industries wanted didn't happen now do you think after 5 years no let the law run like this at large let's not keep on tinkering it right now and keep on pulling it from different directions let it stabilize if at all we want a gst 3 we will look at it after 3 4 years or is the time ripe for this uh mr mani so like i said to my mind gst is more of you know a journey i am being very brief because i think we have run out of time yeah so doesn't GST matter we can more, extend that's not a problem we are we'll gst is more of a journey it is certainly not a destination and not for india for any country gst has never been a destination and in many countries which introduced gst 20 years back they keep making amendments even now and as i said before since it's a transaction specific tax it is not an entity specific tax unlike income tax since there is a transaction specific tax as transactions keep evolving as business practices keep changing as newer business models keep coming the law will have to keep changing to keep pace with that now the frequency of the changes in the law yes it can be legislated we could possibly have a situation where we could say that the gst changes will all be introduced irrespective of when they are announced from 1st of october and 1st of april all changes made during the year will be made effective only from these two dates or throughout the year whatever changes are made will be 1st april of next year 
we can have some mechanics like that this i am suggesting only because we now have to deal with changes all of corporate india has to now deal with changes in tariff which are from 18th of july now the amount of work that is involved in any large business to alter the product master the rate master the vendor master the accounting systems the accounting entries it is phenomenal now to do this on 18th effectively some of the large fmcg companies may have to stop dispatches on 16th and again revive dispatches on 20th so if we can have some sense put into it to say that look let's avoid disruptions in gst let's have two calibrated dates and to my mind first april first october seems to be very sensible anything you do in the first 6 months by default the date of implementation is first october anything you do in next 6 months it is first april so businesses can be prepared corporates can be prepared lawyers can be prepared and everyone is ready because they know gst changes happen only on two days that may be a way of imparting some method into the process of changes but changes themselves to my mind will keep happening and possibly it is good that they keep happening with the evolution that we see in various business practices and uh here uh, any any thoughts from you over and about what uh, money has so that you know we we can quickly go to the summation so that we are running out of time and of course there are few question answers which nothing major i have just seen the board nothing which is very unique because most of them you have handled also but uh, anything from your side on this subject of gst 3.0 no, which you think i i think my take is that the industry has got used to this law now for the past 5 years now they know what happens in a time of supply what happens in a place of supply now if you have to revamp it and then try to get into a 3 and then look at it completely differently i think that will be unfair therefore it is always better retain the existing law let's take as mr mani pointed out keep two particular dates for implementation of all changes two keep the i would say not in the wrong sense the tinkering of the expressions in the law to the minimum let's not do that let's not keep tinkering on the law based on a particular high court decision a particular advance ruling therefore a particular industry a particular aspect of an industry is affected therefore i want to address it no look at it in our overall perspective that's what in fact as i was we were just starting it taxing a hospital bed beyond 5000 rupees when your entire health sector is exempted so look at it from that perspective somebody charges more than 5000 rupees 10000 rupees you want to tax him but the overall health sector is exempted then your emphasis should be on the entire health sector not on x y charging more than 5000 rupees and that that is not going to solve a problem at all somebody has to only increase the medicines by 2000 rupees and then keep the hospital the bed there at less than 5000 rupees see as we say as so money is pointing out we are quite creative in that why we contribute to that creativity so let's mm -hmm. keep the law as it stands let us amend the law to the minimum in, to, in terms of the rulings let us take That's the industry into account and proceed from there sir what sure. oh, just a thought sorry for charging and interrupting uh, gladly the way indirect taxes have been structured in the past most of them thankfully the only humble request would have been don't amend anything retrospectively <laughs> that is the only because that will create a huge huge problem for us for because it is a indirect tax it has to be covered recovered from the end user so that Correct. is the only additional point i would like to besides what the esteemed speakers have already pointed out and i think to be fair to the government also i don't think in gst we have not we have had Too many retrospective amendments. There have been few. Absolutely. Few. I don't think it has happened really for too many things. Yeah, I agree. Rashmi, okay. uh, any your views, please, so that we quickly look at the chat board for some questions. Rashmi, your views. Anything on um, uh, GST three point zero or something? So, uh, as I said, no need for a new law. Just keep amending the current one. And uh, a few pointers that I could bring up, you know, have more. Uh, feasibility or allowability around uh, blocking unblocking the working capital right so uh, say for example just rcms can be set off against input credit rather than paying it in cash and cgst can be utilized across registration so that you know you don't end up paying cash and then waiting for the refunds um, other than that i think overall it should be more simplified 
side, you should have a single system for the returns, e-invoicing, e-way bills, um, all of that. And if possible, get into a centralized registration mode. I looked at the uh, question answer board. Most of the questions, three questions are around why tribunals are not formed. But uh, the industry is eagerly awaiting for filing tribunals before be filing appeals before the tribunals. Dispute will be minimal only when the GST officers are fair and the judiciary will rise to the occasion and uh, what we can expect on this. Can the department insist for a state-wise trial balance? Of course, that looks a very micro management of this question at this level. Um, uh, so on the tribunal aspect, I think the questions have been answered. I mean, considering the suggestions have also come from the members, I think now the government is with this inter-ministerial -com committee meetings which are supposed to take place, I think the creation would really happen very fast and so that the uh, appeals can be filed. Yeah. So that much, uh, and there is one question on, uh, you know, once again, the same, you know, evolvement, uh, evolving theory of what is a supply of service or is it uh, uh, whether the head office, which will perhaps levy on the branches, uh, whether the other branches can avail ITC on it. I think this is, you know, case-specific situation which needs to be seen from their relevant facts. So that will be a fact pattern. We'll have to be studied. We may not be able to answer it across the board. Uh, so that's all for the questions because most of them are on the tribunals. And thank you very much, all the tribunal, I mean, all the panel members for the for your illustrious views and uh, specific thanks to Mr. Uh, Mani and Mr. Shivdas who come on board and really helped us out on the five years of completion of GST. Uh, from Tax India Online side, we always look to disseminating knowledge, bringing the views of the trade and industry to the government and acting as a bridge for development of knowledge. This is exactly what we have been doing since the start of TI oil, which is more than two and a half decades old. But we are doing this very rigorously in the last five years because we know that we have a lot of role to play in the stabilized GST as such and a stable GST as such. Thank you so much with these words and uh, looking forward to seeing you very soon on another interesting issue and another interesting discussion. Thank you so much. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you very much. much. Thank, thank you, everyone. Much. Thank you, everyone.